Hi there. So we're going to start um, a new chapter. Oh, and this is actually, sorry, this is chapter 10. That was a typo. Chapter 10, um, covering some introductions to statistical physics concepts. And this is going to be sort of a happy intro, I hope. Um, we're going to have to break this chapter. It's pretty meaty, so we're going to have to break this chapter into several manageable parts. And so the first part of this is going to be a few concepts from thermodynamics that I think you should review or hopefully Hopefully not see for the first time, but anyway, here we go. All right, so basically, we're going to be talking about entropy, but to lead up to that, I have to explain the concept of microstates and macrostates. Okay, so a microstate is a particular configuration of the individual constituents of a system. So it's not like Rhode Island, not that microstate, but a state of a system. Okay, so first of all, maybe it would be helpful to understand what a macrostate is. A macrostate is a description of the conditions from a macroscopic point of view. So for example, if I said standard temperature and pressure, that defines a macrostate for a gas. Okay, standard temperature and pressure, meaning the accepted value at the freezing point of water and pressure of one atmosphere. Okay, so that would be standard temperature and pressure. All right, so that's kind of a macroscopic description of the system. You might give the pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas, and that's the description of its macrostate. The microstates associated with that system would be zooming in and looking at all the individual little gas molecules and where they are and what they're doing at any given time. Now, there's any number of ways, tons of different ways, that you could arrange those gas molecules and their speeds to give the same macroscopic description or macro state of the given pressure, vol pressure volume, and temperature of that gas. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can arrange a system to get the same macro state, but there's a number of different microstates associated with that system. So the number of microstates associated with a given macro state is a variable we're going to call omega, shown here. It's a pretty standard accepted symbol for this value. We're going to assume, um, in thermodynamics in general, this is a pretty good assumption, that all microstates that give the same macro state are equally probable. Okay. Um, and then it's found in thermodynamics, just, this is just a sheer statistical sort of mathematical statement, that if you look at all the macro states for a system, all the possible different macro states that a system could be in, the system is most likely going to be in a macro state that has a large number of micro states with it. And this is just because that's more probable, okay? So for example, this is a perfect example for this, poker. Okay, so let's consider five card poker hands. So the best hand in poker is the royal flush, and that's when you have the 10, jack, queen, king, and ace all in the same suit. Okay, now since there's four suits, there's four different ways to get the hand a royal flush. So that means that the multiplicity of the macro state royal flush is four. So here omega is equal to four for the macro state of royal flush. Right? Now the next best hand in poker, the next best macro state, is a straight flush. That's when you have five cards in a row, all of the same suit, um, excluding the royal flush, which beats it. So you're not going to include the 10 jack, queen, king, ace in this, but you can go ace, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five, six, and so on and so forth, right? That gives you nine different possibilities within a suit times the number of suit, which is four, so that gives you 36 possible ways to get the macro state a straight flush. Now, you, we can go on and on with this. I'll do one more and then I'm gonna stop there. The next best hand is four of a kind, right? So you can have ace, 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 and then another card, and then two, 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 and then another card, okay? So since there's 13 possible, hand, uh, 13 possible cards going from an ace, all the way up to the king, right? You can have four of a kind, 13 different ways, except for the fact that you've got that fifth card, right? And it doesn't matter what the fifth card is. Well, there's 52 cards in a deck. Once you've gotten four of a kind, you used up 
um, four of them, so that leaves 48 possibilities for that fifth card. So that means that for four of a kind, there's 13 times 48, or 624 possible ways to achieve the macro state four of a kind. So the number of micro states for four of a kind is 624. So that's just kind of a rundown, okay? Now, you can take this analogy even further. The best hands in poker are the ones that have the lowest values of their microstates. So that means they're the least likely, okay? The most likely hand that you can get in poker is zip, nothing, not a zilch, right? Now, if you go through the statistics and uh, the probability of, of how to calculate this, there's actually 2,598,960 different ways to have a five card poker hand, right? Now roughly half of those hands are zip, um, crap, nada, zilch, okay? Not worth anything. So that means that having nothing in a poker hand would be your macro state. And there's, you know, over one million possible ways to have nothing, okay? Now, since all hands are equally likely, you know, if you just deal five hands, deal five cards to someone out of a deck, all possible combinations are equally likely as long as the deck is fair, okay? So that means that having nothing is the most likely outcome out of all possible outcomes, right? All right, so in thermodynamics, we speak of the disorder of the system. And basically, a disordered system is just one that has a large number of microstates associated with it. If there's a small number of microstates, that's considered an ordered system, right? So, in other words, in poker, having a royal flush is very ordered, whereas having nothing is very disordered. That's kind of the language for thermodynamics. Now, if you're talking about, instead of poker hands, if you're talking about the number of ways to arrange the gas atoms in an ideal gas, you can see that the number of microstates associated with that system would be crazy large. Now, there's different ways to deal with crazy large numbers in math, but one way that really helps is if you take a logarithm of that number, then that automatically makes it a lot smaller. So in thermodynamics, um, we define the entropy as Boltzmann's constant, which is a tiny number, 1.38 times 10 to minus 23 joules per Kelvin. You take that and you multiply it times the natural log of the number of microstates, omega, and that gives you your entropy. And then the entropy value is a much smaller number, and so it's a lot easier to deal with the entropy of the system than it is to deal with the number of microstates, where the numbers get very, very large very quickly. All right? So that's how we define the entropy. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of an isolated system increases in all real processes. What that's stated mathematically is that if a system is taken through a process and its entropy changes, you have some delta S, and that has to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so that's the second law of thermodynamics. And a lot of people, um, as you can see here in this little image, chaos will reign, right? That's just a statement that the entropy of the system is going to increase or the a system is going to tend towards disorder, okay? You might have heard of the analogy, you know, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. There's the image of that, right? Um, and that's another way of thinking about um, the second law of thermodynamics. Your book uses the um, statement, uh, another way of restating the second law of thermodynamics is that isolated systems evolve in a direction such that the multiplicity increases, right? So that means basically there's a lot more ways for a system to be disordered than a system to be ordered, okay? Um, so things tend towards disorder, not necessarily for any profound reason, just because it's more likely, okay? It's more likely that a system is going to tend towards disorder because it's more probable. There's more microstates. You may have also heard of the arrow of time. You might have heard of that expression. There's a couple of different um, interpretations of that, but the thermodynamic arrow of time is basically provided by the second law of thermodynamics, because as systems move through time, entropy tends to increase, and that's the arrow of time. Okay, now, the probability of a system moving in time from an ordered macrostate to a disordered macrostate is far greater than the probability of the reverse happening just because of the number of microstates. 
Um, and if you consider a system and its surroundings to include the universe, then the universe is always moving towards a macrostate corresponding to greater disorder. So that's the way the universe works, just because it's more likely. Now, let's put some numbers to this and explain. This right here, this expression, delta S is equal to 1 over T times delta U plus P delta V minus mu delta N. This is sort of a rearrangement of the thermodynamic identity. Basically, this is saying that the entropy of a system can change by increasing the internal energy of the system, increasing the volume of the system, or increasing the number of particles in the system. Okay, so here, U is the internal energy, T is your temperature, P is your pressure, V is your volume, N is the number of particles, and mu is the chemical potential. I'm sorry, that was supposed to be a mu there. So this is how much the chemical potential is how much the system's energy changes if you add one particle at a fixed entropy and volume. It's always defined as a negative number. So that minus sign there, it's just saying minus times a negative number, which gives you a positive value. So if your number of particles increases, your entropy increases. All right? Now, let me explain to you how we're going to use um, this expression, this thermodynamic identity in this chapter. So basically, if you consider the constant volume situation and a constant number of particles, that means your delta V and your delta N are zero. So we can just use the thermodynamic identity and say that delta S is equal to one of the temperature times delta U. Okay, now let's consider just two energy states. I mean, in quantum mechanics, we're often comparing different energy levels, so this works for us, right? Okay, so here we have 1 over T, U of 2 minus U of 1, and that's going to be equal to minus 1 over T times E of 2 minus E of 1, because if the potential energy changes, then the energy of the particle goes the other way. That's why the minus sign is there. Now, if you plug in for the um, expression for entropy, K times the natural log of the number of microscates, um, then you can get this expression down here. Think of the probability of a state being in one versus the other as the ratio of the number of microstates of the system, right? For example, if you flip a coin, um, then the probability of getting heads is one half. So you have two possible outcomes, that's one, and then heads is one of those two possible outcomes. So you're taking a fraction, okay? That's exactly what I've done here, okay? So you take a ratio of the number of microstates for state two versus state one, and that gives you the ratio of their probabilities, okay? Now, if we use our expression for um, the number of microstates and rearrange that and stick in the entropy, then the number of microstates would be E to the S over K. Okay, so I've just plugged that in here in the ratio. Now, when you take a ratio with exponentials and powers, um, if you're dividing, then that's like subtracting the power. So that means E to the S2 minus S1 over K, which is E to the delta S over K. And then if we use our thermodynamic identity here, then that's e to the delta u over kt, or e to the minus delta e over kt. Now this expression here, this exponential, the very last term there, that's the Boltzmann factor, okay? We'll talk more about Boltzmann when we talk about ideal gases in the next lecture. But the Boltzmann factor actually determines populations for different energy states. So if there's a difference in the energy state for two different states, delta E, then you can figure out what the probability of those different states being populated is for a, a given temperature T, okay? Now this is a probability for the population of states. If you remember your um, Physics 2210 course, then um, when you have a function that describes a probability, that's known as a distribution function. All right, so here we're back to the idea of the distribution functions. So in this text and, and many other texts, they use f of e to describe a distribution function that gives the relative probability that a particle has an energy E. Now remember, when you have a distribution function and it's normalized, that means that if you integrate over all possible values, you get a whopping probability of 1 or 100% probability that the particle has some energy, right? And then if you want to know what the probability is that it's in a specific energy range, then you integrate the distribution function over that range, right? 
We saw this for Gaussians and so on and so forth. Okay, So you would integrate your distribution function from energy A to energy B to get the probability that the particle has an energy between A and B. And if you want your average energy, then you would just perform an integral where you multiply your energy times your distribution function integrate with respect to energy. And then if you want the standard deviation, or I'm sorry, the variance, which is the square of the standard deviation, you would perform this calculation. So hopefully this is ringing some bells from your, um, your statistics course. Okay, so we've defined distribution functions. The other important thing that we need to understand so that we can understand the concepts in the rest of this chapter is the idea of the density of states function. Okay, so distribution functions give the relative probability that a particle has an energy E, but that's not the whole story because there could be multiple states that have the same energy E. We covered this when we talked about degeneracy, right? So, for example, if you're um, in the hydrogen atom, an electron in the hydrogen atom, and you're in an energy level n, right, there's two n squared possible ways that an electron in that level can have the same energy, right? You have your, um, your L values, and then your M sub L values from that, and then your M sub S values for each given value of ML. And if you count up the degeneracy, the number of ways that it can possibly have that same energy, you get two n squared. A more recent example is the one for vibrational rotational, I'm sorry, for rotational states. So if you have a diatomic molecule, for example, and it's rotating about some axis, then the number of possible values for each um, value of the orbital quantum number j is 2j plus 1 because it ranges from um, minus j to plus j in integer steps. Okay, So that's a degeneracy for that particular energy level for the rotational states. All right, So when you're considering the um, total number of, um, of values of, of possible particles that can occupy a state, you have to think not just about the probability, but also about any degeneracies that might be in that case. So to do that, we define the density of states. Um, your textbook and many other textbooks use the value lowercase g to indicate a density of states function. So the density of states function g of e d e is defined as the number of states per unit volume in the interval d e at, at some energy e. Okay, so how many states are actually available in that energy range? And then if you want the number of particles that populate those states, that's called N, usually a capital N of EDE. Then you multiply your density of states function times your volume, because you remember your density of states is on a per unit volume basis. So you multiply G of E times your volume V, and then times your distribution function F of E, and then that gives you the number of states in that energy range DE. Okay? Now, if you want the total number of particles, what you would have to do is then integrate that expression over your energy range of interest. All right, so hopefully that is a relatively coherent introduction to some of these ideas from statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. And uh, we'll continue in the next lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions.